In less than 8.5 alternating series, we'll explore the convergence, divergence, some remainder, and some other aspects, uh, including the graphs and um, how to deal with uh, certain things associated with what we call the alternating series. Now, as a quick definition, an alternating series is simply a series in which uh, the terms often switch between positive or negative. Um, it's very possible that you might have two positives followed by a couple negatives and so on. But uh, in a general sense, it tends to be positive, negative, positive, negative. Uh, as you can see, as a result of this, we're going to have a graph that starts up, comes down, goes up, down, up, down, uh, or vice versa. And so we're going to have a whole new set of uh, tools to deal with this kind of thing. Why don't we explore a couple of them now? We'll begin our exploration of alternating series by looking at the alternating series test. Now, this is a two-part test that is used to determine uh, whether an alternating series converges. If we find out that an alternating series does not converge, then we are allowed to say that it does, in fact, diverge. So, right here you see the uh, general form of an alternating series, um, and it comes in two varieties. They're essentially the same. Uh, the only difference is whether they start off as a positive or a negative. So in a case like this, you can see that we have a standard series multiplied by this factor of negative 1 to the n power. Now, you can see as n varies between even and odd integers, uh, it's going to start off, uh, of course, we have n equals 1. So this is going to start off as a negative. Uh, when n equals 2, it'll go positive and will continue ad infinitum. Uh, in this variety over here, we have exactly the same thing, but when n equals 1, you'll see that this starts as an even power. So this will start as uh, an even term, go to a negative, and so on and so on. Now, before we talk about either of the two conditions needed for convergence, I want you to think about uh, the three different ways that an alternating series graph could look. Uh, first off, we could have uh, an alternating series and just arbitrarily, I'm going to choose it to start positive. Um, but it could look like this. This is where we switch from positive to negative, but the magnitude stays the same. As you can see, since we're just going to keep bouncing back and forth and never really approach anything or get close to anything, um, a series like this would, in fact, diverge. After all, it doesn't converge to any number, so it diverges. Let's take a look at another example. In this particular example, um, again, we're going to alternate back and forth, back and forth. But as you can see, we're getting closer and closer to zero. And because that's the case, the limit of our sequence would be zero. Uh, that doesn't necessarily prove convergence, uh, but we'll see that with uh, another condition in place, we can say that this would converge. Now, our final uh, form of an alternating series, again, I'm going to start positive. But take a look what's happening here. It's exactly the opposite of what happened in our second graph. Here, the magnitude is getting greater and greater and greater. Again, of course, we're not approaching any certain number, so this would diverge as well. Now, how can we kind of bring all this together in two statements? Well, we'll say that the alternating series converges if these two conditions are met. Now, the first condition uh, is that the limit as n approaches infinity of the sequence, that is a sub n. And uh, again, that's not looking at the positive or negative. That doesn't really matter here. But if the limit of the uh, terms themselves approach zero, then that means as we go on to infinity, we won't be adding more to it. So that's going to be our first condition. Our second condition, uh, notice that if the magnitude stays the same or if the magnitude grows, we diverge. So what we need to do for our second condition is simply say that the magnitude is uh, decreasing for each next term. And uh, here's how we're going to go ahead and say this. This can be expressed a number of ways, uh, but this is the way that I like best. Um, what I'm going to say is that the next term, a sub n plus 1, is going to be less than or equal to, and I am going to include that equal to, and I'll explain that in just a moment, uh, but that our next term will be less than or equal to our current term. And I'm going to write here uh, for all values of n. So that's not just 
uh, between 1 and 10, and then whatever can happen. Uh, this is for all values of n, and this upside down a is a uh, shorthand for uh, the term for all in mathematics. So how come it's allowed to be equal? Well, take a look at our first condition. Our first condition states that the uh, the limit of this will go to zero. So even if uh, it does stay equal for a couple terms in the interim, in the long run, we will converge to zero. And so if that happens and each term is either less than or equal to our current term, then we can say our alternating series converges. If either of these two uh, conditions don't work, then our alternating series will diverge. In our first two examples, we're going to use the alternating series test to try to determine whether the given series here uh, converge or diverge. Of course, if we meet the two conditions that were given for the alternating series test, then we'll say that the series converges. But if either one of the uh, conditions fail, then the series does in fact diverge. So that being said, let's go ahead and start by taking a look at this one. Notice that we have negative 1 to the n power, and that is my indication that this is in fact an alternating series. Uh, if I go ahead and do the limit of this as n approaches infinity, and I can include the negative 1 in there, uh, in truth it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. And I want you to think about this real quick. The numerator, the negative 1 to the n power, as we go off to infinity, will just go, you know, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1. It will never increase in magnitude, and so it never really becomes an issue here. Uh, however, what you will notice is that while the uh, numerator is not increasing in magnitude, the denominator certainly is. Uh, the limit as uh, the natural log approaches infinity, well, plus 1 if you like, is infinity itself. And so the limit of this series as n approaches infinity is actually just equal to 0. So our first condition is met. Now, our second condition requires us to take a look at the magnitudes of both the current and the next term in each series. So when I say magnitude, what I'm really talking about is the absolute value. And if I want to look at the absolute value of my next term, uh, well, the negative 1 to the n power becomes irrelevant. Uh, when it's positive, it'll stay positive. When it's negative, it'll turn positive. So uh, it's irrelevant, and I'm just going to write it as 1. Uh, on the uh, denominator, however, when I add 1 to n, what I'll end up with here is the natural log of n plus 2. If I look at the magnitude of the current term in the series, uh, it all follows the same logic as far as the numerator. Uh, the denominator will be as given. So the question here, is the next term in our series, the magnitude of the next term in our series, is that less than or equal to the current term in our series? Now, the way to think about this is to just think of any value you like for n. n can represent any term in the series you want. So go ahead and stick any number in there for n. And uh, you'll certainly see that the denominator is getting larger and larger and larger. And therefore, each term is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, this, in fact, does check out. And so what can we say about this series? Well, what we conclude is that this series does converge. It passes both conditions of the alternating series test, and that's what it looks like. So let's take a look at one more example. Uh, of course, I'm going to encourage you to pause this video here and try the next example on your own. But when you're ready, let's take a look. So my hope is that you have already actually attempted example B here. Uh, but whether or not you have, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at it together. Again, I'm going to try to determine whether this alternate series, and again, I know it's an alternate series because of this term right here. So let's go ahead and see if this alternate series converges or diverges. Now, the first condition in our alternating series test is to take a look at the limit as n approaches infinity of the series itself. Uh, and if I do that, the negative 1 to the power of n plus 1 again, becomes irrelevant. But if I take a look at everything else, uh, certainly this uh, ratio would approach infinity over infinity, and you can L'Hopital it, 
or you can use whatever other logic you like. Uh, but what you might notice is that we have an n squared on top and an n squared on bottom. I've already said this term becomes irrelevant, and the plus 5 actually becomes irrelevant. And if you take a look at this, the limit as n approaches infinity of n squared over n squared is actually 1. Well, notice something very important here. 1 is not equal to 0. And as a result of failing our first condition of the alternating series test, I can go ahead and say that this diverges. The beauty of this, I didn't even need to check the second condition in the series. The first one failed, so I'm done. One thing that's very hard to do with alternating series is to try to find their sum. See, because they're positive and then negative and then positive and then negative, it's hard to uh, reconcile all those differences and put it all together in one. So to make up for that, what we do is we use this thing called an alternating series remainder. What this means is that we're going to find the sum uh, of a certain number of terms in the series. We're going to call that a partial sum. And then what we're going to say is our partial sum may not be correct uh, for the entire sum, but we'll find out how wrong it is. And that way we can build kind of a window or an interval and say, well, the true sum is going to be somewhere between here and here. That's essentially what a remainder does. So let's take a look at this alternating series remainder. Uh, it says that if we have an alternating series that is convergent and satisfies the condition that the next term is always less than or equal to the current term. Uh, of course, that has to be satisfied for it to be convergent, but just to reiterate it. Uh, then the remainder, which we're going to call R sub N, involved in approximating the sum uh, S will be the total sum, the sum of all the terms in the series as n approaches infinity. Um, and the remainder between uh, capital S and capital S sub n, which is our partial sum of the first n terms, well, that remainder is simply the difference. R sub n is just the difference between our actual sum and our partial sum. Now, we're not going to be able to find out what that difference is exactly, but what we can guarantee because the magnitude of each term is decreasing, we can guarantee that the remainder will be less than or equal to the value, the magnitude rather, of our next term. So the partial sum for the first n terms is going to have a remainder less than or equal to the magnitude of the n plus oneth term. This is a very, very powerful uh, little theorem right here. And uh, we better go ahead and take a look at how this works. So in the next two examples, what we're going to try to do is to approximate the sum of the series using the partial sum from the first six terms. Uh, in a situation like this, again, notice we have an alternating series. Uh, this is very, very similar to example A. So we do know that it converges. Uh, and if we try to find the first six terms, well, let's see here. Uh, when we have A sub 1, uh, what we're going to end up with out of all this is going to be 4 over natural log of 2. And you can verify that for yourself. Uh, when we have a sub 2, what we're going to end up with is negative 4 over natural log of 3. And this will continue in the same fashion. The uh, 4 on top will alternate between positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. And the uh, denominator will, uh, well, the argument for the natural log anyhow will continue to increase by one for each term. So I'm going to go ahead and write out the uh, first six terms. Um, I've already added them up, so we're not going to spend too much time getting into that. Um, but my sixth term, of course, will be negative then. And so if we add up all of these terms, uh, that plus that plus that plus that plus that, uh, what we're going to end up with is the partial sum of our first six terms, uh, I can approximate to three decimal places as 2.706. Now, how accurate is that for our actual sum of the series? For that, what we want to do is take a look at r sub 6. That's our remainder. And uh, what we know about this is that r sub 6 is going to be less than or equal to our next term in the series, a sub 7. Uh, now, of course, a sub 7, uh, we can just follow this general pattern or however you want to go about it. 
uh, the magnitude of a sub 7, we can see it will be 4 over the natural log of 8, which itself uh, is approximately equal to 1.923. So just to sum all this remainder stuff up, uh, the remainder of our six-term partial sum is going to be less than or equal to 1.923. Given that this is our sixth partial sum, uh, what we can do is go ahead and uh, and put bounds on our series, essentially. We'll say there's our sixth partial sum, and we'll add and subtract our remainder for the sixth partial sum. And that will uh, give us an interval uh, that will extend down to 0 0.783, and it will extend up to 4.630. I keep looking down because I, of course, uh, have worked all these problems out here previously. Now, we don't know what the sum of our series is going to be. And I challenge you, you have a calculator. Go ahead and try the first 20 or the first 40 or the first 100 or even the first uh, 6,001 partial sums. I've tried the first 6,001 of them. And it still remains between this given interval. It will never go below 0.783. It will never rise above 4.630. Um, but even using uh, Wolfram Alpha or whatever utilities you like, you're not going to be able to find the sum of the series. You will only be able to say that the true sum is somewhere in this interval. So that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at one more similar yet kind of different problem where we're going to try to find how many terms it takes to get to the remainder we want. In example D, we're working on a problem that's uh, quite the opposite of our previous problem. Uh, this time around, we're given the remainder. In fact, we're told uh, the remainder right here, that it's 1 1,000th. And what we're going to try to do is find the number of terms it takes before our remainder is at or below that margin. Now, we are told that this particular series um, does sum to the cosine of 1. And so what we'll try to do is uh, keep going until we find a term that is within 1,000th of the cosine of 1. Now, just a little uh, background knowledge here. The cosine of 1 is approximately equal to uh, 0 0.5403. So that's what we're going to try to approach. Now, uh, to understand what's going on here, remember that the magnitude of the remainder, r sub n, and we don't know what n is, that's what we're trying to figure out, but that remainder is going to be less than or equal to the magnitude of the term beyond the term we're looking for, or a sub n plus 1, and that is going to be equal to 0 0.001. That's our given remainder. So the easiest way to go about this problem is to simply look at the magnitude of each term until we find a term that is at or below that. So for example, uh, the magnitude of a sub 0, if you were to plug 0 in here, uh, you would find that the magnitude of that is simply 1, and it is exactly equal to 1. Uh, the magnitude of our next term, a sub 1, uh, if you plug in and work that out, uh, would be exactly equal to 0 0.5. And if we keep going in this fashion, uh, the magnitude of a sub 2 is going to be 0 0.041. So you can see that uh, you know, we are kind of bouncing around the actual value of this series, which is cosine 1, of course, as we said earlier. Uh, the magnitude of a sub 3, uh, in this case, is going to be 0 0.001. And that's the magnitude that we're looking for. There's the remainder. Uh, just to see what would happen if we did go one step further, the magnitude of a sub 4 is going to be 0 0.0000248. And you can verify this yourself uh, if you don't believe me, but there you go. So when are we going to reach this remainder? It's going to happen on the fourth term uh, is when this remainder is going to happen. Now, I know you're going to sit here and say, but this says a sub 3. How are you calling that the fourth term? But remember that this series started out uh, with a sub 0. So 1, 2, 3, 4. This is the fourth term overall. Now, just to have a little bit of fun with this, and just to verify that our conclusion is correct, I have gone ahead and created a uh, chart of sorts showing the cosine of 1 and the partial sum 
of the first few terms of this series. And as you can see by that chart, uh, it is one, two, three, four terms until we're within one one thousandth of the actual sum. So that does verify our results and uh, does show us how the remainder works uh, by looking at the magnitude of each term of the sequence that generates this series. Our last set of examples will deal with the idea of absolute and conditional convergence. That is, we're going to take a look at these alternate series and find out do their magnitudes converge or is it simply the series itself that converges while the magnitudes might diverge. That might sound a little complicated, but let's take a look at uh, what exactly these things mean um, in terms of definitions. So if we have uh, an alternating series, or really any series for that matter, uh, we can say that that series is absolutely convergent if the sum of the magnitudes of each term of the series uh, themselves converge. In other words, if the magnitudes are decreasing fast enough and approaching zero quickly enough, that by the end we're adding just infinitesimal amounts, then we can say that the series is absolutely convergent. Again, for absolute convergence, we're looking at the magnitudes and seeing that the magnitudes converge. Well, if we check that and we find out that the magnitudes themselves actually diverge, we might be on the way to conditional convergence. And let me tell you what that means. What that means is the magnitudes diverge. Um, in other words, they don't get small enough quickly enough. Um, so if the magnitudes diverge, but if the series itself still converges, and remember, this is going to be more the case in an alternating series. So if both of these conditions are met, what we can say is that the series is conditionally convergent. Um, it's not absolutely divergent. The magnitudes themselves diverge. But if the, st if the series still converges, then we do have what we call conditional convergence. So now that we've looked at conditional and absolute convergence, we actually have uh, three options that we can choose from when looking at the convergence or divergence of a series. Uh, we should first check the magnitude of the series. And if the magnitude of the series converges, then we can say that the series absolutely converges. Uh, that's going to be our easiest uh, route to go right there, is absolute convergence. Um, if that fails, if the magnitude itself diverges, then let's go back, check the original series with the uh, alternating uh, parts intact. If that converges, then we can say that the uh, series is conditionally convergent. And that would simply mean, of course, as we said before, uh, that the magnitudes diverge, but the series itself still converges. And if both of those fail, then we have to fall back on our third option, which is that the series must be divergent. So those are the three options we have to choose from here. And in these last three examples, we're going to try to determine whether they converge conditionally or absolutely or whether they just diverge. So let's take a look at our first example. Uh, what we're going to do is take a look at the magnitude uh, of this series. And if we do that, what we're going to end up with, uh, the magnitude is simply going to get rid of this negative 1 part. And we'll end up with 1 over uh, n square root of n, which uh, stated a little bit easier is simply 1 over n to the 3 halves. Now, 1 over n to the 3 halves should sound very familiar. Um, what we can do is use the p-series test on this. Um, this is a very simple p-series, in fact. And what we'll get is that p is equal to 3 halves. Clearly, that is greater than 1. And so what we can say about this particular series, um, it converges. And because the magnitude converges, what we're going to end up with here is that this series and I'll write this out completely, uh, this series does absolutely, absolutely uh, converge. Its magnitude converges, so this series absolutely converges. I can stop there. I don't need to go any further. Let's take a look at our next example. As I do with most examples, I'm going to go ahead and encourage you to pause the video here and try this next example out on your own before we continue. 
course, once you've uh, figured out whether example F is absolutely or conditionally convergent or divergent, come back and join me. All right, so at this point, I'm assuming that you have tried this problem out, and hopefully you began by looking at uh, the magnitude of this series, which in this particular case simply means getting rid of this negative 1 to the n power, leaving us with e to the negative n squared. Now, e to the negative n squared, that looks kind of unlike most of the series that we've explored so far. Uh, until I go ahead and rewrite it a little bit, actually, uh, it's e to the negative n squared, so I'm going to write this as 1 over e to the positive n squared. And you say, well, that doesn't really help much. It still doesn't look like anything. Uh, but what I will argue now is that this is the same as 1 over e to the n quantity squared. Does this look familiar at all? What if I tell you that this is, in fact, a geometric series? Look at our ratio here. Uh, well, first, let me go ahead and write that this is a geometric series anyhow, so we know which test we're using. Um, but in this case, our ratio is actually going to be 1 over e to the n power. And what do you know about 1 over e to the n power? Well, that is going to be, uh, in this particular case, uh, less than 1 for all values of n that we'll be exploring. Again, we're going from n equals 1 to infinity. So any number you stick in here for n will cause this ratio to be less than 1. Well, since I know that, uh, I can say that this series right here converges. And again, I'm talking about the, uh, the magnitude series here. This series converges. And since I know that, uh, what I can conclude then is that this series, the original given series, uh, must converge uh, absolutely. And why does it converge absolutely? It converges absolutely because the magnitude of each term in the series itself converges. So let's take a look at one last example here. Uh, the only thing I'm going to promise you is that this last example will not converge absolutely. We've already seen a couple of those. So uh, let's see what would happen if our magnitude convergence test fails. So I've already promised you that in our last example, this particular series will not converge absolutely. Uh, regardless of my having told you that already, we really should go ahead and verify that. And the way I'm going to verify that is uh, simply by looking at the uh, magnitude of this series and seeing what happens. Um, of course, with the magnitude, that means I'm going to get rid of this negative 1 to the n power. And I will just be left with uh, 1 over the square root of n. Now, I'm getting rid of this 4 right here because as n approaches infinity, this 4 is going to become uh, essentially irrelevant. And so I do have 1 over the square root of n. Now, you should recognize that. That is a p-series. And so if I do my p-series test, what I'll get is that, in this case, p equals 1 half. What do we know about p equals 1 half? Well, we know that 1 half is less than 1. And so this series must diverge. Now, be very, very careful. When I say this series must diverge, what I'm talking about is the magnitude series, not my original series. So this will diverge. Therefore, my original series will not converge absolutely. Well, does it converge conditionally? To check that, let me go back to my alternating series test, which, of course, uh, begins with me finding the limit as n approaches infinity of the terms uh, in this sequence here. And again, that would be negative 1 to the n power over the square root of n plus 4. I can put the negative 1 to the n power back in because I'm dealing with the, uh, the original terms. However, as n approaches infinity, look what's happening to the denominator. The denominator is getting larger and larger and larger and larger. So what's happening to this fraction overall? Smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Again, that negative 1 to the n power uh, doesn't really do much. Uh, except have me go above and below the x-axis. Because the denominator is getting so big, the limit of this will approach 0. And there is my first condition. Now, my second condition is to verify that each next term is less than or equal to each current term. So the way I'm going to do that, recall, 
is I'm going to say the magnitude of a sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to, and I'm going to put a little question mark here, less than or equal to a sub n, our current term. Well, what is this going to look like? Um, again, we're talking about magnitude, so that whole negative 1 thing is irrelevant. Uh, but if I plug in n plus 1 into the uh, denominator, what I'll have is actually n plus 1 plus 4, which I will simplify to 1 over the square root of n plus 5. Now, is that uh, always smaller than our current term, which is n plus 4? Consider that for just a moment. For all values of n that we're dealing with here, that, uh, that is n equals 0 or higher, for all values of n, sure, the next term is going to be smaller than our current term because, again, the denominator is getting bigger. That is a check. And so what I can say is that this series does converge by the alternating series test. It passes both conditions. And so what can I say um, about the uh, level of convergence of this series overall? Uh, what I can say is that this conditionally converges. And I know that, again, because the magnitude diverged, uh, but the series itself converged by the alternating series test. So this is conditionally convergent. And that's what that looks like. Of course, uh, if we did find by the alternating series test that the series did not converge at all, well, then clearly it would be divergent. So it's a lot to process, but look back over your notes, and good luck on your 8.5 assignment.